But welcome to this um, Environment Centre NT webinar. Um, we've started doing these just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so bear with us if things um, take a little bit of time to get right. But I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. And we acknowledge the traditional owners of the country and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And we pay respects to elders um, past, present and emerging. So today we have um, a range of local experts giving us a webinar on the natural wonders of the Casuarina Coastal Reserve. Uh, we're joined by David Little, who's an ecologist, and Deb Hall, who is on the board of the Environment Centre and plays a big part in land care. Um, Amanda Lilliman, who has so much information on our local shorebirds. Um, Damien Stanoic and Jeff Martin, who's going to talk to us about um, some moths. Um, so today we will be introducing the Casuarina Coastal Reserve, um, watching a short video which has been done um, by donation from Nicholas Goldhurst. Um, learning about some migratory birds, the atlas moth, um, how we can all play a role in helping to protect, protect the Casuarina Coastal Reserve. Um, and then we will also be facilitating a chat in the comments section. So these videos have been, well, these webinars and the series that will continue um, over the next couple of months have been put on so we can still connect with our members and supporters. Um, and make sure we're still all learning more things about our local environment um, and having a chance to interact with each other. And we are also asking a poll. And that poll question is, um, what is something interesting you've seen in Casuarina Coastal Reserve that relates to the natural environment? Now we'll move on to our first speaker. So I'm going to go full screen. And um, the first speaker is um, Dave and Deb. So if you wouldn't mind getting started and introducing yourselves, that would be excellent. Righto, thanks Lou. And thanks for the um, opp opportunity to um, yeah, be, be part of this today. I mean, it's a great place. I'm, I'm Dave Little. I, I've lived in, in um, Darwin for um, well, no, de many many decades now, um, and um, yeah. So look, the focus for today is this Casuarina Coast Coast Coastal Reserve, and uh, um, we've just jumped jumped past the map. But basically, it's Lee Point down to Rapid Creek, and then most importantly, out to sea. And what you can see that current image is um, the um, was looking looking out to out to sea. So. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is, is as a way to actually, like just introduce you to, to the reserve for anybody that's not that familiar, is actually take a little bit of a virt virtual tour. So if we, if we jump to the next image, imagine we've just arrived at the top of Dripstone Cliffs and, and we, we stand there looking, looking out to sea. And um, so Lou, perhaps we could jump to the, the next image. Yep. Then, um, then, what we one one of the things that well this is a super low tide that we're seeing there and probably per binoculars as well I suspect um, is 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 old man rock um, which is yeah a really important ab Aboriginal um, site um, and uh, the the sort of the, the the history of this area well goes back you know, many many generations of Aboriginal you, um, living utilisation of the area and, and there's really important things so that. That's a, that old man rock out to sea is actually a, 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 a sacred site. Um, I, I guess just before we actually head off onto our, our tour, I'm just thinking a little bit about the, the history of, of the area. I mean, other, other things that have been really, really important phases have been during World War II, there was a lot of military activity. Um, and I think, Lou, we might be able to jump to the next slide. There's a... Um, and so there were at least 11 um, observation points uh, along the reserve. And so there's an illustration of the, the remnants of one of them. Um, and so there's, there's that sort of remnant infrastructure. About, but the reserve would have had a very different character at that stage. I mean, there were these 
cleared area, so you had views out to sea. There was the observation post. There would have been entanglements of barbed wire, that sort of thing. Um, I guess, Lou, jumping on to the next one, and there, there was also a bit of recreational activity. Um, I, this is a, a, well, from the Australian War Memorial, this image has come. So this would be a war wartime image. So perhaps it's been a um, uh, naked beach for a long time in parts here. Um, Lou, if we keep jumping through then, please. Um, so, and then, all right, so just the, so the World War II was a really important time. Then in 1982, the area was actually declared as a reserve and very shortly after it was declared as a reserve and it came under the administration of well, what was then Con Conservation Commission. And so, and nowadays it's a, we just follow on from the Conservation Commission and we've got Parks and Wildlife are the, are the, the managers of it. Um, so right, so that's, a, that's a very brief rundown on history. There's lots, lots and lots of interesting and other aspects of the history. But I guess the focus today is actually nat natural history. Um, and sorry, Lou, if we could just jump back a bit. So we're, we've stepped out of our car. We've had a bit of a brief look out to, the, out to the sea. But if we turn around behind us and look at some of the grassland areas at the top of Dripstone Cliff, to me, they are really special, special spots. And one particular special thing about them is the um, bushstone curlews, um, which are um, which just accumulate there in huge numbers. I mean, I've sort of stood there and stood in one spot and looked around and seen seen sixty birds at a time, um, which is which is just fantastic. And of course, I have the good fortune of living nearby, so at night at night we just have their their wonderful wonderful calls. So then, if we um, all right, so if we leave the grasslands, head across Trower Road and, and start walking, I guess, north, north up towards Lee Point into some woodland country. Um, then, so this is sort of between Tiwi and the, and, and the reserve. Um, so Lou, if we jump slides again, please. The, um, then, yeah, we're into Euclid woodland now. Hopefully everybody's got a pretty good picture in their head of what, what Euclid like woodland like. Um, is around, like around Darwin. Obviously big recreational use in, in the reserve. Um, there's some great things about the, 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 the limit of woodland that is in the reserve. I mean, we've, you know, we've got threatened species like the, um, the local cycad that, 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 that occurs there. This is going to be a fairly quick tour through. So keeping walking up this track and we come to a spot that's locally known as a moth block. And just near there, there's some really nice melaleucas. Um, so if we jump to a melaleuca habitat. Um, and uh, yeah, melo. Melaleucas are certainly Im Im impressive trees and um, and really well adapted to to I guess the wetter wetter parts of our, our landscape. Heading from there, and we'll come we'll come back from moth block later on. Um, Deb's going to say some things about the, the moth block, so I don't want to dwell too much on that at the moment. So if we head then back down towards the coast. There's a really good walk walking path there, and we we cross some some mangroves. Um, but there's a well constructed boardwalk. And um, so, Lou, if we can jump forward again, please. And um, so this is, yeah, the, man the mangrove boardwalk. And then we go on um, past that and we actually go into rainforest. And um, I guess rather than put a, an image of rainforest, because hopefully everybody's got a pretty good idea of what coastal rainforest looks like. What, one, of the, one of the things that always strikes me about that rainforest, so Lou, if we can jump, um, is the it's the invertebrates that we get there. And this particular photograph we've got here is the um, caterpillar larva of a emperor moth. Um, but I'd really encourage people when they're walking through this area to not only enjoy the coolness and, and whatever of that habitat, but actually look closely at the, at the caterpillars. I mean, there are, and look closely at the insects. There are always lots of really interesting in, insects through there. All right, so we sort of then burst out of the, the rainforest and down onto the, across the, the Free Beach car park and onto the four dunes. And right at the moment, then that's a, um, so Lou, if we can jump forward again, please. Yeah, so right at the moment, but it's just a, I don't know, oh, if I was in Southern Australia, I'd say a golden field of wheat, but here it's a golden field of sorghum. Um, and um, yeah, absolutely, to me, a delight to the eye. The, the seeds have dropped off just in the, in the last uh, few weeks. And, um, and also in that um, coastal dune area is a prominence of um, 
casuarinas, and they are really, really important. I mean, we see red-tailed black cockatoos, for example, uh, frequently coming to this area, particularly in the, in the dry season, and feeding off uh, the, the fruits of a casuarina. All right, so then jumping, keeping going further towards the sea, we're, on, we're onto the beach. Now, the beach has got all sorts of great things associated with it, but one of the things that we're well known for is the, is the turtles. And this image here is of uh, one of a turtle release. So uh, parks and wildlife do release of um, hatchling turtles there at times, and you can actually register. Um, there's quite a long wait list, I understand, but you can actually contact parks and wildlife and register about um, attending one of their rare release sessions. I've been, I've taken the kids to it. Um, it, was a, it was a great thing to do. But so turtles are an ob obvious thing. Um, Lou, if we jump to the next slide, and we're onto a, a, um, a spine-bellied sea snake. So then, yeah, obviously the beach is the interface to the ocean, and the ocean there within the reserve has got all sorts of really interesting things. I mean, there's, there's, I've mentioned turtles, with things like dugons, there's extensive seagrass areas. Um, but this was just, this photo was just taken within the last two months. Uh, one night, a partner and I were wandering along the beach, and here was this um, spine-bellied sea snake that, had, that it was right up on the, on, on, on the shoreline. Um, so, um, yeah, there's all, all sorts of delights. Um, another great encounter, if we go to the next slide, please. So we're on the beach, standing on the beach at the moment. If we head southwards, then we'd go to the, the estuary system at Rapid Creek. If we go northwards, we come to the Sandy Creek estuary. And this pho photograph of this um, sawfish was um, taken, well, it's a couple of years ago now. But um, yeah, it was actually, this was taken at San Sandy Creek. Uh, so it's just amazing. I mean, I was blown away by the fact that we've got things like sawfish um, in, in San Sandy Creek. And, and sawfish are another uh, list of threatened species in the, in the NP. So then, thing of estuaries, and if we go up to Lee Point and then go to the um, around further, then what we come to is Buffalo Creek. And that point, that from Lee Point to Buffalo Creek is actually really, really important for migratory birds. I mean, places like Sandy Creek are as well, uh, which are gonna be one of the foci that we'll get to later in this uh, session this morning. So Lou, I might hand it back to you there and um, to take on for our next bit, please. Okay, so what we're going to do now is play a five minute video that's been, um, filmed and produced by Nicholas Goldhurst um, for donation for the Environment Centre NT and for all of you to watch. And um, if you have a bit of a slower connection and it's not playing properly for you, uh, we have uploaded this video to our uh, YouTube channel um, and we will share the link in the Facebook event afterwards. So you can all go and enjoy it at any time that suits you. So I'm just going to skip along and um, Press play.
Okay, so thanks, Lou, for that. Um, but just a reminder that that video is going to be let mounted um, on the, well, sorry, loaded on the um, ECNT website. So I'd really encourage um, people, particularly if you're missing some of the audio that goes with that, um, to go to the website and have a have a look at that um, that that video. It's fantastic, and I guess I talked about some of the habitats earlier and. And yeah, there's some wonderful Im imagery of that. And part of the imagery that we saw there was also um, to do with the beach and, and the bird hide at, um, between Lee Point and um, Buffalo Creek. So at this stage, I'd like to invite uh, Amanda Lilliman to, um, well, in introduce herself. And Amanda's great, one of her great areas of expertise is actually migratory birds. So Amanda, are you? Um, yes, hi, thank you. So, so Amanda, would you like to just say a couple of quick words to introduce yourself and then tell us about the yes, fantastic yes. story of a great night? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, um, so I just, I just had to check something. So my name's Amanda Lilliman. I am a shorebird researcher based at Charles Darwin University. I have uh, just finished my PhD on migratory shorebirds in Darwin Harbour, so looking at their 
general ecology and how to best manage them in um, our urban setting. I also am involved in a project on the Far East in Curlew, which is one of our largest shorebirds in Australia, and um, am involved in the BirdLife Top End Group which is a volunteer organisation part of BirdLife Australia. And uh, I just wanted to share some information on this great knot, which is our most common shorebird that we have here in Darwin Harbour. And it's a critically endangered species under Australian legislation. So that means within Australia, um, it's got the highest level of conservation status and therefore protection. And because of that, and the fact that we have so many of these birds in the coastal reserve, we've got um, up to 9,000 great knots in the coastal reserve. The uh, Lee Point and Buffalo Creek and also Sandy Creek is classified as internationally important. And, uh, and that's, that's, a, um, that's based on the number of birds that we have at a site at one time. And so this bird is a migratory shorebird that only spends half of the year here in Australia. It breeds in the Northern Hemisphere in, um, in Russia, Siberia, and then it spends its time um, migrating through Eastern Asia where it stops in at the Yellow Sea. It might stay there for several weeks or a month, fatten up and then complete the rest of its migration to Australia to Darwin and to our coastal reserve for our summer season or our build up and wet season. And so at the moment, most of these birds have traveled north to their breeding grounds and they are in the Yellow Sea region right now, fattening up and they're going, uh, they're going further north after that. So um, there's a photo, that photo I took it um, of, these are the great knots, that's at Sandy Creek. So they, they will roost at Sandy Creek and roosting means resting essentially. So at, um, you can go to the next slide. At, so this is their, their migration pathway. This is called the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And it's essentially showing the map that the shorebirds take. It's like a migration highway that the birds travel within. There's no boundaries. It's purely dictated by the birds' movements. And um, it's just something that we classify as humans. So, um, so there you can see the non-breeding habitat in Australia and Southeast Asia, and then it's breeding habitat in the Northern Hemisphere. So when the bird is here in Australia in our build up and wet season, it's spending all of its time in coastal habitat. It's considered a coastal obligate, which means it only spends time at the foreshore in, um, in the coastal environment. It will spend its time feeding at low tide on intertidal invertebrates, things like pippies and bivalves, which it, it gets from the sand and the mud. So it pokes its billy and it can feel the invertebrate in the ground and it pulls it out. And it just, it's do, doing that for most of the low tide period. And then as the tide starts to come in, the birds will rest um, usually up the beach, so at Lee Point, Sandy Creek and a couple of other places. But Lee Point and Sandy Creek are definitely the most important shorebird sites around Darwin Harbour. And um, they're also so, um, so well visited by people, all of us using the beaches. And uh, uh, let's see what the next slide is. And so this is one of the bird hides that's in the uh, Casuarina Coastal Reserve. And now we've got, yeah, the next slide is a photo of uh, the no dog sign. So from Lee Point through to Buffalo Creek, it's no dogs allowed because of the international importance of the migratory shorebirds at the beach. So for people walking their dogs, they are allowed to turn left once they get to Lee Point. If they go west, they, they can have their dog there, but um, towards the east is no dogs within um, that area. So, um, but most of you probably know that. The reason why is because the dogs, um, as well as humans, disturb these birds if they get too close uh, to, the, to, the, to the birds. So the birds like some distance, essentially like a buffer zone, and uh, and 
when they are disturbed, so when, when, the, when the people and their dogs get too close, it actually can cause the birds to fly off. And that can be a waste of energy for the birds um, when they actually need those fat reserves for their long distance migration. The other birds you can see around the foreshore of the coastal reserve, um, there's, there's almost 30 species of migratory shorebirds that we get here. We're very lucky. We also get the Far Eastern Curlew, which is, um, which is another critically endangered shorebird. And you can see those birds at Buffalo Creek and at Sandy Creek. But at this time of the year, most of the birds have flown north uh, on their migration. So it can be a little bit hard to see some of these birds, but there's still a few around. Just this morning, I was out at Lee Point doing a monthly bird life uh, shorebird count, and I counted about 500 shorebirds, including 300 of these great knots. So um, I think I'll wrap it up there, but I will just say that if anybody's interested in getting involved, we do a monthly monitoring program through BirdLife Top End and they can get in touch um, with me or with anybody else in the BirdLife team or in the shorebird community. We're always happy to um, have new people come in and, and get involved in counts. So, um, so yeah, please, please do um, get in touch. Thanks, Amanda. That's, um, that's, that's great. And what a fantastic story. I mean, we've got you know, 9,000 of the critically endangered birds that come and you know, use, use the coastline in, in Kajarina Coastal Reserve. And it, you know, to me, the, one of the standouts of that story is it really highlights why we actually do need um, to be really careful about where we, where we take our dogs in the, in the reserve. Um, our next session um, and speaker that we're going to move on to now is Deb and Jeff, who are going to be talking about land care and the Atlas Moth. Thanks for the opportunity to have a bit of a say as part of this. and. Um, yes, Jeff and I are both very passionate about the reserve and the creatures in there, so we'll tell you a little about that. Um, I've been asked to participate in this um, Zoom session because I've had a long association with um, Casuarina Coastal Reserve through Landcare um, over about 20 years. Um, the Landcare group actually started in the late 90s and it's a, a very enthusiastic and rather dedicated group of volunteers that learn about the local plants, um, spend time meeting their neighbours um, and really lend a very um, substantial hand to the reserve in terms of looking after natural habitat. Uh, we have monthly working bees. We do lots of different activities. Sometimes we um, are watering. Some a lot of the time we're weeding. We do a little bit of planting. We've done a, a microplastics assessment at one of the sites Amanda just mentioned. We also do an annual rubbish cleanup along the creek that goes in front of the hospital. Um, and at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to to see some links. We have a Facebook site which is Friends of Casuarina Coastal Reserve, um, and that's where we'll put notice about our events. Um, in 2013, we were part of um, a Commonwealth funded project <clears throat> along with um, land care groups at Ludmilla and East Point and the project was called Corridors of Green. The funding was to um, help out endangered species and the species that we focused on was the Atlas moth. Jeff's here and he knows a lot about the Atlas moth so I'll hand over to him and he'll tell us something about this very special moth that we have planted for and hope to see one day. Good morning, everybody. You can go a bit still, closer, Jeff. Still morning. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so the the picture on the screen you're seeing is a nice big female Attica swordo. Uh, now she's about um, twenty two centimeters across. And she's hanging onto a cocoon for dear life because they they sit on the they come out of their cocoon they emerge about eleven o'clock at night, um, come out sit on the outside of the cocoon, and uh, dry their wings, hang, letting them hang down and pumping their wings up to get the blood supply going, and she stays there then for up to two nights without making a move and hoping to attract. Uh, some young fellows from uh, 
or I don't know how far away they can waft the pheromones around, but possibly a good kilometer, I would think, and possibly two. Um, Special things about this moth, it's the smallest species of atlas moth in Southeast Asia, Australasia. So we're right on the very southern limit of atlas moth range. Uh, and the northern limit is way up to southern China, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. Um, they, yes, well, they only just hang on around the coastline from uh, we know of them and being Coburg Peninsula. I don't know about Croker Island, possibly I would have thought so. Uh, the Tiwi Islands, mainly Melville, and then along, uh, along the coastline from, I suppose, Coburg all the way down to uh, Channel Point. Um, I haven't heard any records of them being in Channel Point, which is the mouth of the Daily River. Uh, but it's big, tall rainforest down there, and I think that they would have to be there. Um, there's a record of them, um, Kimberleys, uh, right up the north, I think Lassur Island or somewhere. So they could well be hanging on just right up the very north of the Kimberleys. Um, so when, it, when we go north from here to, uh, say, or northwest to, to Timor, that's a different species again, that's At Atticus dotide. Uh, this one used to be called out of Atticus stereotype, but then they realized that it's a separate species. So, um, okay, well, I've pretty well, well seen locally to Darwin, it's, it's uh, along the Gunpoint coastline that faces towards, uh, towards Darwin, I suppose, is that west facing, yeah. Um, pretty well all the way down to Muramujuk, down to the bottom of uh, Tree Point which really, as the crow flies, is pretty close to Casuarina. So we're hoping that, uh, that this picture, sorry, is a, that's a, a male. That's a typical male, quite a bit smaller than the female. And this one's probably 17 centimeters across, wingtip to wingtip. Uh, the, the eye fenestry windows, they're, they're clear. So they're, they're see-through, and it's a, part of the breakup camouflage. So when one of these is sitting in amongst some dead leaves, especially this time of year when the leaves are turning brown and yellow, they're awfully hard to see. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to, I've never really seen a live one during the day in the bush or the jungle. I just don't see them. The only way you're gonna see one really is if they say on Melville Island, Snake Bay or somewhere they've flown and sitting on somebody's wall because they got attracted to a light and then they really stick out. But yeah, otherwise if they're in the jungle, in the forest, oh, very, very cryptic camouflage and a beautifully colored animal really. Um, oh, recent seasons of, uh, well, the last two or three wet seasons have been very, very poor on. Um, I've been, been checking it, keeping a check at gunpoint haven't seen any kind of trace of, gun, of atlas moths at gunpoint, any of those jungles along the coastline there. Dundee, the, Dundee is about the best place. They keep turning up uh, to people's lights occasionally. This year we've only seen males, haven't seen a female. But hopefully they're out there and they've been out there and they've done their thing and laid a few eggs and they're keeping the population ticking over. Um, so really, for us locals, the only most likely place to come across one is, is Dundee uh, during the wet season after 11 o'clock at night. So if you can, if you can stay awake up, well up after 11 o'clock up until a live stay up till oh, after three o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah, so um, what else do we, can we say? Uh, well, we just hope that the next we start getting better, longer and bigger wet seasons so that the, uh, the moths can build up their numbers again and possibly hopefully move along the coastline and uh, locate and uh, populate places like Casuarina Coastal Reserve and even around to um, 
to uh, East Point. That would be really good. Thank you, Jeff. What Jeff didn't tell you is that he's a builder and he's actually gone to building sites because he's heard that there's moths there. Like he's followed the moth around. He's, he's very, very um, knowledgeable about the subject. Um, so what we did at the moth block was um, talk to Jeff, uh, talk to Parks and Wildlife and set up a planting that provides food for the atlas moth. And we did it um, with a design like a golf fairway. These are very big moths, as, as Jeff said, you know, uh, adult females got a wingspan of about 22 centimetres. So they don't want to go through closed forest. So that's why we set up the flyway uh, pattern for our planting. And we planted three species of tree that are particularly um, favourite foods of the moth. Um, one is called Croton habrophilus, and it's a rather beautiful small tree, um, the leaves of which turn bright orange um, when they're um, dropping off the tree in sort of August, October time. Um, there's another tree called the Pitosporum, and another one called Litsia glutinosa. Dave will know a lot more about these trees. So we've, we've planted those three and we planted a whole lot of other trees too, because um, there's a species list of trees that appear in Casuarina Coastal Reserve. It's pretty long. Um, and so we worked closely with Parks and Wildlife about our choice of species because they're the managers of the area. And the moth block itself is the junction of a number of different habitats and Dave might like to comment about this some more. But on one side there's the mangroves and we've seen pictures this morning of the mangrove boardwalk. Um, there's also the paperbark forest which um, is where Nicholas's film began. Um, there's a deciduous forest on one side and a monsoon vine forest on another side. So that piece of ground which was quite bare when we started planting um, is an intersection of various habitats which makes it really um, a fascinating place to watch birds and look for insects and one day we hope that we have icing on the cake which is uh, a sighting of a moth. Over to you Dave. Yeah, Deb, I was for a comment here. Look, I mean, you've done a wonderful job there of, of outlining the habitats nearby there. But what that does highlight to me is just throughout the reserve, and it's not a very really big area, um, but there's this amazing diversity of habitats. And it really actually struck me, I've been keeping a bit of an eye on the, the chat comments that have been coming in this morning. And there's been more than one comment about what people have enjoyed is the, the diversity of habitats and being able to see all these different things in such a small area. Anyway, sorry, back to you. Oh, there's a few more pictures of moths coming up. So there's one um, in the forest. And um, Jeff, those patterns on the back, those light patches, are they? is it possible to see through those? Yeah, you can see straight through those clear windows. It's all about breakup camouflage. See, they, they, they're very beautifully coloured, which is very strange for a moth. You know, normally they're very dowdy brown, dark coloured. But uh, this coloration is, is it's purely about camouflage and breakup. It's not to be seen to be pretty, really. And they rely on scent to uh, find each other. Yeah. So um, the moths have something called like, they'll, they'll um, so if, if they're using smell, um, Jeff, what sort, how will they All find right. each other? Well, okay, the female, She's the one that wafts her pheromones around. It can be different with butterflies. Sometimes it's the male, sometimes it's the female. In the atlas moth, it's the female. She sits on a cocoon, and from the moment while she's drying her wings, she's sending out this beautiful scent out and about. And the males need to track that scent down with their antenna, so they smell through their antenna. That's the sense of smell, or the smell, the scent organ, and they they will fly around sort of fairly haphazardly, I suppose, until they come across a pheromone scent trail, and then they're gonna work their way up that scent trail to find that female. So they might use a creek, or they might use a path, or something like that, where they can fly quite quickly and easily? They, and can, they can use a flight path, which can be a path, or over a creek, or along the side of the beach, or the, or the sea, or the cliff. They can do that. They're also letting themselves up into danger from boo box and uh, barking owls and things like that. So it's a dangerous game we play. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll think about those moths out there playing dangerously in the middle of the wet season. And the, um, 
the PowerPoint slide we have up now looks like some eggs, Jeff. Okay, this is a Litsi gluconosa tree, and uh, there's five atlas eggs on the edge. So these are quite large eggs, and they shine um, like little pearls in, at, late at night. So they can be, they can, we can find them that way. I think this particular area was in uh, the Shoal Bay area one well, now, and we had to get special permission, permission to go in because it's, because it's run by the military. And um, it was quite a nasty, wet, horrible jungle. <laughs> I wouldn't, didn't like going there very much, but uh, it's good moth habitat. Oh yeah, now this is the size. Oh, that's the size of a, uh, a full-grown atlas larva, and I, I wouldn't do that now. I wouldn't let one walk around on my hand because I'd be frightened of it getting diseases off me or fungi. So that's how big they get. And he's about of the. It's about the age that it's looking for a place to pupate. So this is taken a few years ago. Um, yeah, that's the size they get, and these are incredibly hard to see in the wild. You, you wouldn't, it's a sort of whitish green color, but again, they're it's good camouflage. And Jeff, I've heard that one caterpillar can eat a tree that's about two meters high. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. eat the leaves off a tree, de de demolish the leaves on a, on a two meter tree quite easily. Yeah. So, us land carers are hoping that we turn up at the moth plot one day and find that there's a um, the Croton habrophilus that is completely stripped of leaves and we think that might be a good story because it might mean that there's a hungry caterpillar out there. Okay. Um, I think it's time that we started talking about threats to the Casuarina Coastal Reserve and just as a way of sort of opening the door to that, um, I think it's worth mentioning that in 2002, um, a survey of visitors found that there were 935,000 visits per annum to Casuarina Coastal Reserve. So it's right up there in terms of popularity um, to visitors. And um, those of you who are tuning in today will know that it's been pretty crowded lately. There's um, an enormous number of people using the Coastal Reserve at the moment. Um, but if, the, if there were 935,000 visits per annum in 2002, we can only imagine that it is now well over a million visits per annum. And We've also had new suburbs um, up against the Casuarina Coastal Reserve in the shape of um, lions. Um, we've had some sort of residential infill and probably more density of housing along the coastline um, altogether. Um, people are really seeking out these, these places. So there's a lot of pressure from people on Casuarina Coastal Reserve. Um, Dave, would you like to lead off on this or shall I? Oh. Yeah, look, I'll happy to say a word or two and then pass it pass it back to you. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's a there's a there's a number of threats to reserve, and I, and I guess um, Deb's just you know, indicated one, just people pressure, um, and and one of the the forms in which that people pressure arrives is, is sadly arsonists. And the image that we can see up there at the moment is uh, well, it's taken just near the Free Beach. Um, car park or from a free beach car park and it's look, looking towards the, the coast and um, and this was after the, the, the fires that happened last year um, and there's quite clear evidence that the, a series of fires there were, were, were lit by, by arsonists. The, I guess this is probably perhaps a bit hard for people to remember but one of those photographs I showed earlier when I about the sorghum, the golden fields of sorghum, well one of the trees that we've got in front of us here is actually the very same tree. Um, and so these fires have um, all sorts of impacts on the, on the countryside, but yeah. one of the impacts on that coastal area is actually, it encourages more sorghum, which, um, which is great. I love sorghum, it's a great, great plant, um, but sorghum itself burns really well, which then there's a bit of a, a, re, a reinforced cycle of, of the, the grasses get promoted and, the, um, and then the, you get more fuel, which means next time it burns and you're likely to get a hotter fire which will have a, a an impact on the on the woody vegetation and i guess in a in a minute or two we'll we'll jump onto some some weedy weed issues but one of the, the really important aspects of those weeds is the um is the changes in, in fuel load but um, um Dave, Deb, did you want to say 
More yeah, about I'd the, like the fire say, bit. Yeah, I'd or, like to say a bit more about fires. Um, I heard that last year there were 26 fires in Casuarina Coastal Reserve. And I think it's really important, and I long-term users of the reserve will know this, that the damage from a fire is not fixed in a year. It actually takes a really long time for that landscape to recover as a diverse, mature set of trees that are habitats for all of the insects, reptiles, mammals and birds that um, should belong there. It takes a really long time. Um, as land carers, it's certainly taken us more than 10 years um, with our work along the dunes. Um, we'd be looking at definitely another 10 years um, before we can get anything like um, the sort of vegetation mix and the maturity of the trees that we need. Um, and some of the species of birds, and I know um, black tailed red tailed black cockatoos has come up in the chat. You know, there are there are cockatoos that need big trees. There are birds that need hollows in mature old trees. So the tree that we can see in the center of the shot here, the dead casuarina, you know, it's not it's not food for any bird. It's not ha it's not shelter for for many animals that need it. Um, so Fire is a devastating impact on Casuarina Coastal Reserve. And in, in recent years, it's been almost right along the dunes from Rapid Creek through to Lee Point, a sustained um, effort to, to burn that whole coastline. So for everybody who's um, tuned in this morning, I'd ask you that if you see a fire in Casuarina Coastal Reserve and the rangers are not there, the fireys are not there, please call triple zero. That fire should not be happening. Um, last year, we had fires into the monsoon rainfor the monsoon vine forest. Um, that area should not be burnt. Those fires opened up canopy um, where there was sunshine going into that area. Then there was grass and some of the um, really bad weedy grasses. So when um, uh, somebody came along and set a match to it, we lost monsoon vine forest. Um, so yes, if you see a fire, please call triple zero. There will be um, a few fires that the rangers set, and that's just in terms of protecting um, assets in the park. Um, they need to you, do an annual burn um, along the back of Macrilla Circuit there, where the houses are so close to the reserve. They do a few other small um, protected burns, but generally if um, there's a fire in the reserve, it shouldn't be happening, and as soon as we, the sooner we can get it out, the better. Um, over to you, Dave. Okay, well, perhaps if we can um, jump onto the next next slide. So I guess this is, in some ways it's an extension of the um, of, of of the fire story. But what we've what we've got in the, the fore, foreground here is mission grass, and so this is one of one of the weedy species that's been introduced to the the top end that really has a huge impact both due to both from its competition with native species but also because of the, the huge uh, fuel loads and you can see this photograph is taken just right next to uh, i guess it's again near the free beach car park we seem to be coming back here a lot a lot this morning um and you can see we've got a on the right hand side we can see a, a black wattle that succumbed to the, the fires last year on the left hand side we can see a um a casuarina that, that succumbed um sitting in the middle paper bark which is um, thankfully a little bit more resilient to fire about enough fire and you can even smack the paper barks around but that that papery bark actually does a magnificent job of, of insulating them but um yeah look mission grass so it, it's a it's a huge issue um in the reserve it's a huge issue in lots of places ar around around darwin and uh, uh one of the things i'd ask people to do in regards mission grass is be, be aware about spreading the seed. And we're just coming into the, the seed time now where the, the you know, seeds are being, being set. So for sure, enjoy the reserve. And again, we've seen lots of comments this morning in the chat about people enjoying the paths, enjoying the diversity of habitats, and obviously a fantastic recreational use of, use of reserve, which, which is great. But if you're, if you're moving around and you're wandering and you're traveling through some patches with um, mission grass, and try not to spread the seed. Just be really, really careful about getting it on your clothing and, and spreading it around. So, Deb, did you have anything else you wanted to say about, about mission grass? Um, as the less there is, the better, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in terms of the, the less there is, the, the, the better. 
Lou, if we can jump to the next slide. This, this, this is another one, which is a, the, the less we have, the, the better. So this is gamba grass. And, and this is, um, this is well, just as big, perhaps a bigger fire issue than as, um, as mission grass. So this photograph was taken up toward, towards Lee Point. And you just see that it's, well, what I would think of as a horrendous fuel load in the, in the <laughs> foreground there. So the, I mean, it's just, well, the fires, you, can, you get three or four times the, the, the fuel load that we'd normally get with, with native grass species, and the fire intensity can be up to eight times more, more intense. So it just absolutely smacks the, the overstory, so it'll kill, kill the overstory trees. Um, and thankfully, there's actually been huge amounts happen in terms of gamba grass. Um, generally, in the, the well, the NT in, in the last few few years, and there's very much an on ongoing program um, to to try and do stuff about gamba grass. Gamba grass, fortunately, is actually, in my opinion, far more controllable than mission grass. I'm not trying to trivialise it; it's still a huge job to control it, but but it is far far more controllable. So, um, yeah, there's, there's there's significant effort going going on, and I think what we're going to see. Um, is later this year is scheduled for a new gamba grass uh, weed management plan that will steer the direction for the ENT community, not just casualty in the coastal reserve, but steer the direction for the, for the next decade. But um, yeah, Deb, if I, would you like to add anything more about gam gamba? I think the same as before, Dave. The less there is, the better. I mean, the, the, de the density of, of the grass in that photograph really shows you how it would absolutely smother any attempts at regrowth. Um, little plants just wouldn't survive in that. And then, like you say, add a match to the dry stuff and it's, it's a tinderbox. Um, the other thing about gamba, I understand, is that it can invade pretty intact vegetation communities. Is that true? Uh, yes, I mean, most of these grasses will do better if there's a bit of disturbance. So it's a, yeah, you're right, it will invade quite intact um, vegetation communities. Um, but I guess having intact vegetation communities are invaded less quickly yeah. than if you've got disturbed communities. So there's, there's sort of a gra graduation, gra graduating scale there. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct that yes, it can invade pretty much undisturbed areas. Um, mm. All right, so um, Lou, perhaps we should pass it, pass it back to you. I see we're getting very close to our um, nominated time here. Oh, sorry. Deb, I'm jumping, um, jump, jumping the gun here a little bit. Over you to you are. to say something about land care. I would like to say something about land care. Um, I've previously, met, I've already mentioned that, that land carers have been working in the reserve for 20 years. Um, we have currently got two sites that we work at. One is um, in the dunes near that um, Free Beach car park. The other one is at the Moss Block, which is over sort of just off Rocklands Drive. The photograph that you can see here is some of the planting that we did in December 2019. Um, and we welcome new volunteers. So if people would like to uh, make contact with us and find out when we're doing things in the reserve, um, have a look at the Friends of Casuarina Coastal Reserve Facebook site. Um, we work very closely with the Parks and Wild, Wildlife Rangers. They are um, incredible supports for what we do. Um, and it's an opportunity to um, do something positive for the reserve at the same time as um, hanging out with people that uh, probably share your interests in learning about the local um, local wildlife and local plants. Um, I think uh, this is the group that did that planting, the, that slide there, and you can see um, there's quite a wide range of ages and um, we're looking a little wet because even though the bomb site said there was nothing in the sky, it actually rained on us that morning, but it didn't upset anybody. In fact, it was quite nice and cooling on that December morning with the late um, onset of our wet season this year. Okay, so um, I wasn't sure whether our other guest, um, Damien Stanoic, made it from, and he was from um, Parks and Wildlife, and he hasn't had a chance to speak, and I think he's still on the line. So. Have we missed anything you wanted to um, comment on, Damien? Yeah, look, I'm happy to just have a quick talk about our turtle program that we do on Casuarina Beach. Great. If anyone's interested. Yes, please. So, yep. The program started 
um, the mid 90s as part of just the general research the Parks and Wildlife were doing and there was a lot of public interest around it. So one of our um, rangers had been doing the, in the program for a long time, Ray Chatto, decided that he would take the program to the next step and start educating the public about turtles and turtle habitat. It became very, very popular. And as most people know, there's a huge waiting list now for the turtle program that we run throughout the dry season, which sadly may not run this year. So why do we interfere with the nest in the first place? So as we've already discussed here this morning, the, the traffic on Casuarina Beach is potentially over a million people now. And so when the turtles come up to nest, they, they can nest any time throughout the year, but the, the main peaks are in the dry season itself. And they'll come up on the high tide, they'll make their way to the dunes, they'll dig themselves a nice chamber. She'll usually use her front flippers to excavate quite a lot of sand first. Then she'll use a rear flippers to dig herself a nice, tight, narrow chamber. She'll drop in about 50 to 60 eggs, depending on how mature she is and, and the size of her. Backfill and head back to the ocean. And that's the way they've been doing it for eons, and it's no problems at all. But when there's more and more people on the beaches, more and more foot traffic, people, uh, dog traffic, more feral animals, things like that, we thought we needed to sort of step in. We're the only city beach anywhere in the world that has free ranging turtles, marine turtles coming up and nesting on our city beaches, which is really, really spectacular. Um, so we want to protect that. Turtles will always return to the same place that they're born or hatch in this case. So when the turtles start to hatch, we'll, or sorry, when mum comes up to lay her eggs, we'll make an assessment. So we don't remove every nest or rescue every nest. We Look at the situation. Pretty much any nest that's in high tra traffic areas for people, such as anywhere between, let's say, um, Lee Point right through to the Free Beach, we'll take the eggs from there only because during the dry season, lots of people have picnics on the beaches, there's bonfires of the night time, things like that. And of course, as the turtles start to hatch, any sort of light, which can be the light of a bonfire, they'll travel towards that light. So we'll rescue them pretty much for, for that reason. And, and occasionally turtles will lay in the wrong area. So they might lay in a, in a depression, so to speak, or where the sand or the beach sort of dips down, which means if we get a nice big tide and, you know, it's about 50 to 60 days, depending on the sand temperature for those eggs to hatch, there's a very good chance that, they, that some of those nests could become inundated with water. So that's another reason why we do move them. We don't move them far, but we move them to a, a location. We record all that and we replicate the chamber itself. So we'll dig the chamber, the same depth, same moisture levels. We'll take some information on the eggs. We'll then bury them back up. And generally we leave them. Um, we'll go back when they're due to hatch and we'll collect some of the hatchlings earlier that morning for a public releasing later that day. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a huge waiting list. Because it is fairly popular, there's anywhere between five and 6,000 people that are on the turtle waiting list. So it, it can be a, um, a long process. And one of the guests I had at my talk last year, she'd been on the list for seven years before she was contacted. So it's just the way it works. Most people are only on the list for three to five years before we give them a list, give them a call. But it's opportunistic. It just depends on how many nests we actually rescue and then how many of those um, produce huge volumes of eggs. So it really, on, it, as I said earlier, it really depends on the size of the female as to how many eggs that we get. So the eggs basically are the size of ping pong balls. So, um, and being, the flatbacks are one of the species that has a, the largest size egg, but because the eggs are so large, she has one of the smallest clutches. So most sea turtles, like your greens, things like that, will have close to 100 eggs, depending on the size of the female. As I said, ours tend to be anywhere between 50 and 60. So yeah, it just really depends. So Thanks. that's pretty much. Oh, great. Sorry. Thanks. You're wrapping up. That's excellent. Um, I can't believe it's three to five years, the average uh, wait list time. So um, everyone, please put your names down now. <laughs> like oh. a in the yeah. future. 
Um, but thanks for all of that information. I'm so glad we saw you all online and were able to have um, you share that for everyone. And um, we might move along now to the chat and poll. Yeah, okay, Lou. A great range of um, interests that people, people have expressed and, and raised some, some really good questions. But there's all sorts of things in there. I mean, one, one of the things that strikes, stands out to me about a lot of the, the questions or a lot of the comments that have been made um, is clearly representing the re recreational use of the area, but the use of the tracks and the diversity of, of habit, habitats. Um, there's, a, there's quite a number of comments there about the boardwalks, about the, the mangroves. I've, I've noticed one there about watching crabs and fish and birds and, and snakes. Uh, several comments about the coast, beautiful coastal path, um, loving the beaches and the, the natural coastline. Um, mangrove jumps up, mangroves jump up a, again. Um, there's a, a comment there about bringing international visitors um, to, the, to, to the area. Um, and actually a comment about the striking or the visitor being hit by the striking architecture of the, of the bird observatory. Um, so it's interesting to, to, I mean, I'm, yeah, I think it's great to see that there's such a, a variety of, of interests that people are, are, are talking, talking about. Um, the, just a, a few other specifics that were, were, were raised were things like the, um, the orb, orb, wide, orb weaver spiders, the uh, uh, nephila spiders, um, stone curlews get a, get a mention. Um, so yeah, birds, birds certainly um, come up pretty high in the, um, in the, the let's say, frequency of, of discussion. Perhaps if I just jump on to one of the, well, a couple of the questions that came in pertain to um, at, Atlas Moth and perhaps it, uh, well, there was a question of what, what tree the, the, the eggs were on. And look, I haven't got the image in front of me at the moment, but I would have thought that was probably the, the litia. But there were three species. There was the Croton habrophilus that um, Deb mentioned. There was a Pittosporum and then litia glutinosa. Um, were, were Dave, the, Dave the Jeff species. thinks that um, it was the, the litia. Litia, yeah, okay. Right, great. Fantastic. So I'm certainly comfortable to say I'll go litia on, on that. Um, but Jeff, one of the... Um, interesting questions that's come in is wh why would we want to encourage the atlas moth in this environment? Now, I mean, I've got my view on that, but do you want to um, put your two bobs worth in on that one? Yes, yes, thanks, Dave. Yeah, well, the thing is, historically, the moths were right around the coastline of Darwin. They were probably uh, on the, uh, the Esplanade, Parat, Fanny Bay, you know, East Point, they were right around because uh, the Mothman from Karanda, F.B. Dodds, found them back in 1907. They had to sail around from Karanda. They came back in 1909 and then his son came back in, after the Second World War, after the First World War, I think back in the 30s. So they, they used to be here. That was, was, but of course, since the Second World War, and then Cyclone Tracy, if the Second World War didn't get them, knock them out of Darwin, then Cyclone Tracy certainly would have done. So, you know, me and some other people are, and a few of the Landcare people are interested in getting them back in around Darwin so people can see them. Uh, you know, that that's mainly the, the thing. Um, and... It's unfortunate that you don't fly till at least 11.30 at night, but, but you know, it's just nice to know they're here and they're, they've regained their ground. I think there's a, there's yeah. a, there's a bigger picture there, which um, Jeff has sort of opened the window to, and that is about diversity. Um, and I think it'd be nice to get a comment from you, Amanda, and also you, Dave, and, and Damien, about this one. But... What happens when um, weed species invade, when things are out of balance in, uh, in an ecosystem? Is that you get domination of one thing or another? I mean, we saw that, that um, the slide of the mission grass and the slide of the, um, of the gamba grass. You know, you've got, a, an, you've got a, a habitat which is, instead of being diverse, it's dominated by one thing. And we are still uncovering the webs that, um, that hold ecosystems together. We don't know about all the elements. We don't know how things need to 
to be in balance with each other. So the best we can do, I think, for ecosystems and you know what the land care group continues to do is to sort of support and increase that diversity. So I don't know, Amanda or Damien or Dave, would you like to have a view about comment on that? I totally agree with, with Deb on that one in that the, if people really like that diversity of habitat, uh, yeah, keeping the whole system intact will allow diversity of species. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree with you on that one, Deb. Yeah, comments are, I agree with everything, yep. Yeah, okay. Look, I'd add, you know, my, my support there too. I mean, clearly about diversity and I'd, and I'd also highlight the lack, lack of understanding. Um, and you know, one of the big things is to get out there and observe, look and, and enjoy. And, and with that comes empathy and understanding. I think an, an illustration of this, of this question of diversity, I mean, the, the, nobody really knows why Atlas Moth has disappeared from, from Darwin. I mean, you can make some guesses about it um, in terms of you know, there were areas like coconut grove area had a lot more rainforest than what it does nowadays. So we've actually seen loss of rainforest in the, in the Darwin area. We've obviously had an increase in, in lights around the place, which you know, how that might affect um, Atlas Moth is, is I guess up, up to question a, a, a bit. And what I think that's, that's actually telling us um, something more about the big picture of diversity in the Darwin era. I mean, one of the outstanding things of rainforests in the top end is that they actually occur in tiny little patches, little postage stamps across the countryside. And, and where they actually, for maintaining the rainforest, but also for maintaining mobile fauna and things that use the rainforest, if we actually need that patchwork, lots of little patches is actually how the system works here. And so the, the loss of some of these patches of rainforest around Darwin has knock-on effects that we actually don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think to me, symbolically in a way, you know, if we were to have rainforest, if we were to have atlas moths actually reappear around Darwin um, and be surviving around Darwin, that would actually be telling me that we've got a, a, a better mix of, of habitat patches in yeah. the Darwin area. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you to everyone who um, helped in present today and share your knowledge and for all our participants in tuning in. Um, Kajarina Coastal Reserve, as we've seen, is a really special place and um, we hope that if you haven't already been down there and experienced it for yourselves that you can head down there and take a look and um, try and spot some of the things we've learned about today. Um, consider getting involved with some of these organisations like BirdLife um, and the Field Naturalist, Naturalist Club and Landcare. Um, I think BirdLife has some citizen science things happening at the moment, which is great. Um, and also get involved with the Environment Centre NT if you haven't already. We have a monthly um, donation program called Territory Guardians. We really depend on our members and supporters um, to connect everyone with the environment and help protect um, our beautiful nature here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.